the sacred idea of oneness. The idea here that man, nature, God, the cosmos, energy, we're all interconnected, we're all interrelated, interdependent, there's a wholeness. And so if that is, if that truly is the dominant worldview, the other worldview, besides the biblical worldview that says no, it's not one, in fact, God is transcendent, exalted beyond the created order, God stands apart from the universe, he's representing the idea of two, God, and then all the rest. But however, if that oneness concept is a dominant worldview that underscores all ancient myths and modern myths, well then we should see it being the core to drive us towards a one world, one global ideal. And that comes through, again, with world federalism on the political side. It comes through with global citizenship education through UNESCO. It comes through with the cultural side, the social side. And that's the transformational festivals we'll be talking about. Hello, everyone. So after the other day putting together the video I just did uh, with Ravi Zacharias reciting the, uh, the parable of the madman by Nietzsche and, and how I wound up using some footage from the Electric Daisy Festival, which is one of these transformational festivals that happens to be the one in Vegas every summer, kind of just seemed to kind of fit perfectly with the whole culmination of, of rejecting God, killing God. You know, the <laughs> the eventual outworking of returning to, to atheism, which is really uh, paganism or pantheistic monism or anyways. But just using that footage reminded me of this video that I made way, way back in 2015. One of the very first videos I, I ever put together, uh, I called uh, Transformational Festivals and the Myth of Oneness. And it was basically because I'd been so inspired you know, inspired or excited about this conversation, this podcast, one of my favorite podcasts at the time, that was uh, called uh, The Mind Renewed with Julian Charles. He's in the UK. And he talks about uh, biblical apologetics, the New World Order, Bible prophecy, philosophy, you know, all my favorite topics. And so he did an episode with Carl Teichrib talking about transformational festivals, such as uh, Burning Man and Tomorrowland and lightning in a bottle, all these different festivals, and it was explaining how the underlying theme, the underlying philosophical core behind all of these different festivals and all these different things is the message of oneness or pantheistic monism. And honestly, uh, the quality, the sound quality uh, is, is really bad. I was st still kind of figuring out how to even make little videos. But I just made it because I was so captivated by so many different points. There's so many nuggets in that conversation that I just... But he's talking about things that visually, you know, it just, they kind of were just screaming for, um, you know, some sort of visual to be put to it. And then I was trying to put some sort of electronic, you know, music, you know, soundtrack to it to kind of fit the theme. But the, you can't, it's really hard to hear the quotes from Carl Teichrib. So what I'm going to do is just play that whole podcast for you because still, even to this day, this is, this was such uh, an impactful conversation on me because it was like the first, I had heard about pantheism and monism and oneness, all that before, and, you know, other related uh, avenues of research that Tycrib has done involving the UN and technocracy and one world order and his collaborations with the, a researcher named Patrick Wood, who also has great stuff on technocracy. I'm sure many of you are familiar with these guys, but when I heard Tycrib explaining this whole idea of the, the oneness myth, and he talks about ancient myths and modern myths and how they, they preach the same thing and how, you know, just talking about how man, nature, and God are all one, they're all interconnected. And this is the underlying message that is being preached and, and taught through these, these expressions, through these, these vehicles of these festivals. And really, this was like right before I came across Flat Earth. So I was like really primed, right? And it, it, and it just really clicked in a new way, listening to this. And so... It's been a theme that has run all throughout all of my flat earth stuff because I, you know, I, I just like recently really, really absorbed this and was just blown away by just, I think it's the idea that realizing that, okay, this idea of, of oneness of this, the, the new age gospel, essentially being absorbed by new generation, this new wave of people who aren't necessarily thinking, thinking of it in, in a very, 
in such a blatantly articulated way, and yet they are absorbing the, just the underlying core elements of, you know, what is essentially the mystery of religions, the Babylon religion, the one world religion. And he, and he talks about things like modernism and ma scientific materialism and how and the younger generations rejecting that and going back to this age of enchantment. And so all this is really fresh in my mind when then I'm coming ac across Flat Earth and then because of Flat Earth, suddenly looking into things like NASA and Copernicanism and listening to Neil deGrasse Tyson, right? Which I honestly just wasn't really paying much attention to before. And then lo and behold, you're hearing the same, <laughs> the same message of oneness, the same message of, oh, we're all connected with, with man and nature and Oh, we are star stuff, and it, you know. So indeed, Carl Teichrub has played a major role in you know my kind of understanding of how Copernicanism and mysticism all fit together, and my whole channel really. And it ties into transhumanism, and it ties into to everything else. And so, it is something that I think is really key for a lot of people to to try and absorb because it's real easy to kind of compartmentalize various concepts and teachings, and you know a lot of people. They can understand that there's a, a globalist agenda or a, a new world order agenda with things like, you know, the UN or the Pentagon or all this stuff. Bohemian Grove and the Vatican and blah, blah, blah. But they don't necessarily see the same agenda going on at things like Burning Man or all these festivals that are just... It's crazy how big and out of control they are. And yeah, you look at them and... And I know it's probably easy for a lot of people to kind of write them off as just, you know, crazy hedonistic... You know, it looks like just some big out of control, neon, drugged out alien orgy, right? And and so, and it is a big, you know, hedonistic festival, this big bacchanalia type thing, but there's more to it than that. There actually is a message, and that is what I think is important for, for people to absorb and understand if you are to understand the pressures of, like, how this New Age message is just creeping into every every corner of our culture and society around the world certainly not limited to the United States or the West or any of that. So, without further ado, here is one of my favorite podcasts of all time, featuring Carl Teichrib and Julian Charles. Welcome to The Mind Renewed. <laughs> They're so worried that they've got to take over down here the direction of where it's going and get a one world system together, get rid of nationalities, to get one government, one religion, so we won't have war. That's the effort of man to bring about his own salvation. Hello everyone, Julian Charles here of TheMindRenewed.com, coming to you as usual from the depths of the Lancashire countryside here in the UK. Today is the 2nd of October 2014, and I am very pleased indeed to be able to welcome to the programme Carl Teichrib, who is Chief Editor at Forcing Change, that's ForcingChange.org. And Forcing Change is a Canadian-based information and intelligence portal designed to document and analyse, from a Christian worldview perspective, the religious, social, governance and economic agendas, movements and initiatives that are now radically shifting Western civilization. And Carl himself is the author of countless reports and articles on globalization. He's been an accredited observer and participant in many UN and other international events and conferences. And he is currently a senior fellow with the August Review, which of course is the online research publication of Patrick M. Wood, who was a guest on this show earlier this year. So Carl, thank you very much indeed for coming on the show. It's great to have you on. Well, thank you so much. Now, the subject that we're going to be discussing today is something that I, I should think that a fair number of people in the listening audience will, well, I've not have heard of it at all, or have encountered it in a very fleeting way, you know, in some kind of news report or something like that. And that's the subject of transformational festivals. And the most well-known of these, I'm, I'm guessing, is the one called Burning Man. And I'm, I'm saying that because that's the only one <laughs> I'd heard of <laughs> until very recently, uh, which is held for uh, a week each year in, in uh, Nevada. But I understand there are very many of these now, and uh, they're called festivals, so it can sound as if they're little more than just a, 
a big extravagant party, but uh, there's a lot more that needs to be said about these indeed, and we'll be going into some depth, I hope, about that in a moment. But, Carl, can I start by asking you if you would to explain a little bit more about forcing change, first of all, because the obviously that introduction that I gave there was a bit cryptic, and I basically pulled those things off your website. So I think it'll be helpful to get a clearer picture of what it is. So what is forcing change? Why did you start this as well? Well, this is now the eighth, coming on the ninth year of our publication, Forcing Change. It's a monthly magazine that takes the Christian worldview approach and documents and analyzes various economic, social, political, and technological trends and how they are challenging and and shaping our world around us and how they challenge Christianity in particular. So it it is a biblical worldview approach into the subject matter, and and a part of it, Julian, is is to simply uh, inform and and bring knowledge into the Christian community, so that we're not ignorant of these events, so that we don't become gullible players in these events, so that we can have a better understanding of how our world is changing, what's forcing it to change. And then how we can become uh, ambassadors of Jesus Christ, literally the salt and light that's necessary as our, our neighbors, our friends, our family starts asking the questions, well, what in the world is going on? <laughs> and we'll be able to, to use the material that we've developed. Like I said, it's a monthly magazine with a lot of reports as well. And, and I encourage people when, when you have a subscription to it, pass it around, use it as, a, as an entry point to discuss these issues with, uh, within your own Christian community, your church, your family, your friends, and also within your non-Christian circles of influence. Use it as an entry point, uh, a way to begin some, hard, uh, some hard-hitting discussions. I'm not going to not going to apologize. It is a, a more of an academic based uh, publication. We have a lot of documentation, a lot of footnotes, and so we, we come to the table with the idea that what we need to do is is have a solid understanding of these challenges and how this change in our Western world is coming about. Mm-hmm. So this is looking at how the world is becoming more of a global community, but also the way in which this is actually not just happening by chance, as it were, but this is actually being forced in in some ways. Is this why you call it forcing change? Yes. In fact, the idea of having this uh, as something that is being forced is not necessarily that it means that there's somebody behind the scenes with a whip driving it forward. There are people and movements and events that definitely drive uh, the the, uh, the concepts of change uh, ever progressively forward. There's no question about that. But really what it boils down to, it boils down to the fact that this is a movement. This is a movement of history and the, and the various mm. components that come together are what drive this change. And uh, I believe very firmly that there is a spiritual aspect to all of this. But ironically, where I got the name Forcing Change from was from a a British fellow by the name of Arthur C. Clarke, the famous science fiction author and scientist. And in his book, Childhood N, he has a quote. And I read this quote two decades ago, and it always stuck with me. This is what he said. 50 years is ample time in which to change a world and its people almost beyond recognition. All that is required for the task are a sound knowledge of social engineering, a clear sight of the intended goal, and power. And that is forcing change. And I must just ask you, do you feel that the way that the world is actually being forced, both by the events of history, but also by some organizations and individuals who might want to force it in a certain direction, a mixture of all those kinds of things, do you see that that's actually being forced in the direction of um, an authoritarian one world system? I've seen it firsthand. When I've attended various United Nations events uh, or world federalist events, and world federalism is a political movement that openly advocates for world government, that they have been very involved with the creation of the International Criminal Court. In fact, if it wasn't for the world federalists, the International Criminal Court wouldn't exist. They were very involved in, in forwarding the doctrine of responsibility to protect the idea that the United Nations, NATO, and the international community have a responsibility to intervene domestically uh, when a nation state is incapable of working on its own. And there are some pros and cons to all this, but it the, the demonstrates that there is indeed power behind the ideas 
And there are people and concepts here that, that push forward on this and, and direct a certain amount of change. Now, I was, like I said, I've seen a lot of this firsthand, including the spiritual side, the cultural side, because all of this comes into play. It's not just simply one strand of human endeavor. Uh, there has to be a complete picture that emerges. And so, uh, you know, I'll be honest, a lot of these people I've rubbed shoulders with are good intentioned. They mean well. Um, they believe they're doing the right thing. But they also believe that they have what Thomas Sowell called the vision of the anointed, that their worldview, mm. their ideas um, will, will be the guiding influence that shapes society for the salvation of society, politically or socially or religiously. Yes, this is one of the things that when I was speaking to Pat Wood uh, came up in the conversation with the idea that if you're going to have people accept some kind of one world system, then it has to be attractive. It's got to be something that people will actually buy into in some way. So what you're saying very much seems to fit with that conversation. It strikes me, it's amazing that you seem to cover so much in your work. You know, you're you're almost talking about everything. <laughs> we must have an amazing <laughs> mind <laughs> to gather all these facts together. What kind of background do you have? I mean, did you come from a, a family which encouraged you to go down this kind of research route? Not necessarily. My mother and my father are both Christians. My mother passed away only a few years ago. My father is still alive, uh, but they were both readers. They, they were thinkers. I come from a farming background. My, my father uh, had a grain farm. I grew up literally as a farm boy. Um, my educational background is very Spartan, very shallow. I only went to high school. In fact, I quit high school at the end of grade 11 because in the words of the famous Western author Louis Lemur, I found that high school interfered with my education, so I left. <laughs> <laughs> I attended Bible college for a couple of years and, and received an associate's degree, but really what it boils down to is that I have uh, a desire to know, a desire to learn, a desire to dig into, into various uh, streams of thought, wrestle with it. And I've been doing this for, well, I've been doing this since the early 1990s and then full-time since 1997. So I've been around for quite a while, kind of behind the scenes, working with other authors, other Christian organizations, feeding them the data, feeding them, them the research material that I work with. I, I guess one thing I have to bring into this conversation is that is that I recognize that if you, we are truly on the verge of trying to transform the world in our own image, it must incorporate all those various streams of thought. And so I approach this by trying to understand, okay, what is the core principles between, let's say, international politics, global governance, international environmentalism and the environmental movement, the core philosophy that underscores the drive towards a global economic system and a structure, and I've written extensively on that a few years ago, and uh, as well, the religious component and also the social cultural sides and, and including things like education. So I've been to conferences on global citizenship, education, and a wide range of different events, including new age conferences and new age events. Uh, and my job has literally been to go in where I can, document, research, talk to the people, rub shoulders with them. Uh, glean from them to understand which way they're trying to push the world, because they also have a, a worldview, they have a belief, they have a structure, goals and aspirations. And so in all of that, the thing that strikes me is the bottom line is that this is a move towards what Peter Jones from Truth Exchange calls one-ism, mm -hmm. and what others have talked about as being the idea of oneness, the idea here that man, nature, God, the cosmos, energy, we're all interconnected, we're all interrelated, interdependent, there is a wholeness. And so if that is, if that truly is the dominant worldview, the other worldview, besides the biblical worldview that says no, it's not one, in fact, God is transcendent, exalted, beyond the created order, God stands apart from the universe, because he's representing the idea of two, God, and then all the rest. But however, if that oneness concept is a dominant worldview that underscores all ancient myths and modern myths, well, then we should see it being the core to drive us towards a one world, one global ideal. And that comes through, again, with world federalism on the political side. It comes through with global citizenship education through UNESCO. It comes through with the cultural side, the social side. And that's the transformational festivals we'll be talking about. And it comes through with the religious side, as I've sat in as an observer at the G8 World Religion Summit and other interfaith events. 
that are very strongly pushing towards the idea of let's all work together and create a, a global ethic, a global religious spiritual paradigm. You all can keep your, your individual religions and individual faiths, but we will make sure that, that we don't step on each other's toes and we'll, we will acknowledge that all religions are roads, are pathways up to the same mountain top called God. And I've watched even as a Christian community has joined hands in that endeavor. And that, that's truly for me disturbing. So that's why I have to take a look at all these various fields of activity, because if oneness truly is the dominant paradigm, the way of the world, well, it will represent and show itself in every facet of existence. And when you start digging it through, you realize it does. I think that's why your work is so important, because so often that kind of religious or spiritual dimension to looking at this globalization is often left out, isn't it, of the picture? Because I suppose that's an influence of secularism and uh, scientism and the like that people tend to think, well, and it's going to be these sort of secular political solutions and technological solutions which are going to make the world into a better place and leaving outside the religious dimension. That's just something of, of people's personal experience and personal preferences. But actually, you're saying that a religious worldview of some sort is actually central to these developments that are taking place. Absolutely. The other thing, too, that we, we have a problem with in our Western academic world and in our Western way of thinking is that we tend to compartmentalize. We'll say we're an expert in such and such a narrow field. And then what we end up doing is missing the fact that there's all these other strands and various fields of study that need to be examined because yeah. it's all pushing towards a certain direction. And so I, I've run into this myself when, when dealing with other Christian authors who, who only have a very narrow view of how the world works because that's their academic background. That is, that's what they've been trained in. And so for myself, I've tried to look at a, at a broad picture and understand the, the, the core element that brings the various fields together. And that's the idea of oneness. And as you said uh, just a few minutes ago, that oneness is very much going to come into these transformational festivals. And I guess these, which we're going to be talking about now, these festivals seem to gather a huge a sort of eclectic mix of elements and uh, sort of bring them into one. So in a way, they're kind of pictures of what you're talking about. And we need to tease that apart now. Um, now, as I said, that I was not really aware of any of them except Burning Man. And uh, then a, a listener brought to my attention the fact that there were some others, and particularly this one called Tomorrowland or Tomorrow World Festival in Georgia just last month. And this uh, particular listener suggested that I contact you because of all this research that you've done into this. So can we approach this step by step? Because obviously there are things of great concern here, but I'd like to just start with a kind of factual base. Could you give us an idea just what these festivals basically are and how many of them are in existence at the moment? Well, how many are in existence is an interesting question because earlier this spring, I had tracked down 120 to 150 of these festivals worldwide. Some of them fairly small, uh, a few thousand, some of them very large, uh, running into the hundreds of thousands. Uh, but I was wrong. There's not 120 to 150. There are potentially hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, maybe even upwards of a thousand of these events around the world. The majority of them in North America and in Europe. And it is remarkable how, how many exist even in places like Latin America, you find them in Australia, New Zealand. Uh, they, they, it is truly a global phenomenon. And this is one thing that organizers and advocates of transformational festivals recognize, that now we have literally a global phenomenon taking place, a social, spiritual, communal phenomena that brings together the idea of celebration. And that's but the bottom line is this. They are celebrating. It is a celebration, a teaching and a preaching of oneness through art, through music, through dance, literally, again, through the celebratory acts. And as uh, we were talking about before we began the interview, we've always had music. We've always had party. We've always had celebration. Uh, we've always had community. But what we're seeing now is the incorporation of these components into a, a very specific way of looking at the world around us and the future that we wish to achieve. And that's one thing that's very important with transformational festivals. These are viewed as models, very short-term experimental models of what the future is that we wish to achieve, the world that we want to participate in and experience. And all of these parts and pieces come together within the transformational cultural movement, uh, be it festivals or even just transformational events, concert-oriented with a, a strong theme of oneness 
and Tomorrowland and Tomorrow World represent that side and the other. Uh, you could almost call it the swing of the pendulum, openly pagan gatherings and pagan celebrations. Some of them have been around for a long time. And in the middle of all this, you have the transformational festival itself, things like Burning Man, uh, the Orzoro Festival boom. Uh, you have a few in the UK as well. Uh, which incorporates music, which incorporates workshops, lectures, uh, yoga, it incorporates uh, sustainability, the green movement, and a lot of dance and music, big art installations, all of this to, to bring about an experience of a new reality, a new way of looking at the world. And so you've got a full spectrum and a nuance uh, that you find within this movement. And did you say that Glastonbury, the Glastonbury Music Festival, has become taken over by this? Oh, it has very much moved into a transformational event. Glastonbury, as you well know, and as most of your listeners will know, has been always viewed as a music festival. Yeah. And over the last 10 or so years, has slowly moved, and specifically in the last five, it has moved into a transformational uh, event. It's not that it is a full-blown transformational festival. I mean, most people go just for the music. But it incorporates spirituality. It incorporates workshops and lectures. It incorporates green spaces, uh, sacred spaces. It incorporates all of those elements that push us a new worldview forward. And that's the point. It go, that, that's why this becomes more now than just simply a concert experience. You're there for a full awakening of your consciousness in various realms of spirituality, green living, communal living. Uh, mm -hmm. It's gone far more, it's far beyond just simply I'm there to listen to music and to flick my lighter or now my, my cell phone and raise it up high, you know, and, and, and oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. we all groove to the music. It's way beyond that. It's way beyond. And, and that's what makes the, these things so important. And the music itself from the, some of the documentaries that I was looking at seems to have moved as well. So that it's not so much a, a band there up on the stage in many of these festivals, but an actual real participation in very especially electronic dance music so that everybody's involved in this and getting a, some sort of hypnotic kind of effect from it. This seems to be much more rather than just bands up on the stage. Right. And even the stages for some of these events are, are phenomenal constructions of art. Uh, Tomorrowland and Glastonbury's had some phenomenal, phenomenal stage work mm. where the stage itself becomes an integral part of the experience of transformation, where you feel that you are in another world, you're in another reality, that you're living and experiencing and breathing this new way of looking at the world and how you can model this together. And the stage itself seems to, because of all these installations and artworks that uh, actually participants in the festival, I understand, actually create a lot of this, they're dotted around all over the place. It's like the, the audience is actually in amongst the stage, uh, like a, just a living space in which this is all happening. Right. And, and I give I give them kudos for, for recognizing the psychology and, and, and the way that humanity behaves and how to, to, to bring about something that is very appealing that brings you in and involves you in the event, the experiential part of it. Uh, they understand that very, very well. And that's what makes these events now different than the old concerts of, of yore where you would just go and sit on a grassy field, listen to a band, and then go home. Or a muddy field. <laughs> a muddy field, right, right. <laughs> yeah. Now you're part of it. You're experiencing it. You're feeling it. Uh, it's moving you. And you're part of actually creating that mythical reality yourself in, in whatever you're doing, your artwork or your r religious ritual or whatever it is that you want to bring to the festival. Right, right. So that's yeah. – and, and this is why the, the this movement of transformational festivals is growing. Demand – and this comes from one of the Burning Man um, organizers from last year's event – demand is far outpacing supply. Wow. And how many people are actually going to these things? Well, Burning Man this year brought in approximately 70,000 people. The Tomorrow World concert series that took place this summer in Belgium, mm -hmm. pardon me, not Tomorrow World, Tomorrow Land, there's a difference, brought in about 360,000 people. Wow. And what about the uh, one in Georgia just recently? Did you have figures for that? Right. Tom that's Tomorrow World, and I believe it was around 140,000 mark. And it's tough to get tickets to these events, really tough, because there is such a demand. Oh. Just to give you a sense, Julian, last year's Tomorrowland Festival, when the ticket office opened, over 2 million people flooded the lines to try to secure one of 180,000 tickets that were available. 
uh, because it was only a one weekend event last year. This year it was a two weekend event. And the event itself sold out reportedly in under one second. <laughs> I didn't think that was technically possible. I didn't Incredible. think so either. In fact, from what I understand, it created such havoc. This year they, they had to structure their ticket sales system differently. And, and Tomorrowland was done over two weekends. It brought in 360000 And the tickets sold out in under an hour for that event or for those two events. Wow. I mean, uh... And these are people from all over the world who are going to this, you say. So presumably, these are, are they mostly young people with plenty of money? Uh, Tomorrowland and Tomorrow World is, is definitely geared towards the university crowd, the college student. And yes, they are coming in from all over the world. In fact, when you go into Tomorrowland, uh, you can book a flight on Tomorrowland aircraft, charter jets, and uh, they fly in from cities all over the globe. And, and it's not just simply a Belgium event. It is truly a global event with participation, because it's recognized the audience is participating, participation that rivals and exceeds that of even the Olympics. That's how it's been described. You sent me some links to various of these promotional materials, and I had a look at the Electric Daisy Carnival promotional stuff, and uh, this was their a trailer to their Under Electric Sky documentary, and I picked up on some of the attitudes of the obviously the filmmakers, but also some of the the people who attend this because you know their quotes were used in the little film there, and I just picked up on things like uh, people were saying this is a mini utopia, it's a a world free of problems here. This struck me particularly. This somebody said, "Oh, this is something for the kid who eats their lunch on their own." You know that the lonely, disaffected person can find some sort of acceptance here. And then people travel here for a dream. This is the best weekend in my life. If people only loved each other as they do at uh, Electric Daisy Carnival, the world would be a better place. So, the whole thing seemed to be set up as this is a kind of heaven on earth if you see what i mean obviously not the biblical heaven but nevertheless it seems to be presented as a kind of answer to everything that we can all come along and imagine this new world in some way that's so true in fact here's four quotes just pulled from different individuals when i've been following these these events the the interviews uh, some of the documentaries some of the reports have come out of it uh, these four quotes, again, just as you just described, demonstrate that this is a, a new way of looking at the world and that it is a utopian way of looking at the world, that this is somehow, somehow something that will alter your life individually and also collectively. Here they are. Here's the four quotes. Regarding transformational festivals, simply the most extraordinary spiritual and political and cultural thing that has ever happened to me. And of course, it completely affected the rest of my life. Here's another one. The experience of Burning Man was just so overwhelming and so powerful that it literally, literally sent my life on a 90-degree turn from the direction it was heading, and I never looked back. Third one. These festivals are really doorways to open a whole life-altering change. And finally, having the trans experience changes your life forever. I don't think there's any way you can see the world the same after you've been through that experience. Julian, what this represents is that these people who participate, and these are just regular people who have made these kinds of comments, and I could go all day with comments similar to this, it represents the fact that these events stir up the spiritual component of who you are, stirs you up to almost have a religious conversion type of experience, something that draws you in, and now you feel mm. a spiritual connection to this, and it does change your reality. It does change your life. Uh, this is actually quite interesting because there's a lot of ritual in these festivals, but they're not preset rituals. You kind of bring your own ritual and then develop rituals with other people. At least that's the impression that I'm getting. And my initial reaction to that sort of thing would be, well, you know, if there's something that people are just making up on the spot, they're not going to have any particular power. But I, I didn't expect to say this, but a couple of weekends ago, uh, an, an old school friend of mine visited us and um, he plays the piano and I play violin and we, we have a, a history of sort of improvising together and you know whatever comes up musically that we, we sort of follow each other you know that and we've done this for years and it works really well but this time he said something which quite struck me we, we improvised for about 40 to 45 minutes and it got quite intense you know really good ideas came up and he said to me afterwards um i now realize the power of ritual because he said, I feel quite different having done that. Because, you know, we, we don't meet anywhere near as much as we used to when we were young. You know, we meet about once a year at the most. And he said, oh, no, I, I feel the power. I can understand how people develop strange rituals and it changes the way they see the world. And I thought then, having looked at this material here, I thought, good heavens, yes. That's a small example of something that's going on here in a big way. People are creating these rituals and they do have power, amazing power. 
Yes, and some of them are very spontaneous. Others are more guided and more structured. Uh, just to give you an example, in Burning Man, uh, not only do they have a human effigy that they burn at the end of a week of bohemian living, uh, but then the following day on the Sunday, they burn a temple. And this temple becomes a, a, a lightning rod for spirituality, for a somber reflection of, of your life and purpose. And what's fascinating, and I've not been to Burning Man, but I have friends who've gone, and I've watched with my wife the live feed. I've watched intently for a number of years already, and I interact with burners and the burning culture in various other spaces. Uh, uh, what's interesting is is when the man burns at the end of the week, there is exuberance, there's excitement, there's fire dancers, fire drummers, fire virgins, it's pretty wild, mm. fire priests, it's an amazing display. On the Sunday, when they burn their sacred space, their temple, the place where organic rituals, interactive participation in spirituality have, have happened, uh, sometimes in a very um, loose kind of way, other times in a more structured format, and when they burn the temple... It's quiet, it's sacred, it's somber, it's, it's a solemn reflection of what's taking place. Another example is the festival entitled Lightning in a Bottle, which takes place in Southern California. About 15,000 people go to that. And it is noted for its sacred spaces, for its organic spirituality that emerges, and yet it still has a structured spiritual ritualistic component. It has its temple of consciousness established, and that becomes almost the, the lightning rod again to bring about a ritualistic experience, uh, whether it is uh, impromptu or whether it is organized. And so you're right, the ritualistic sacred element that comes through these transformational festivals is something that is very, very powerful. And it speaks also to the fact, Julian, that we are not materialistic people. Uh, we, we are not living in a modernistic world of raw materialism where mankind is nothing more than a meat sack. We've rejected that. Yeah. In fact, we're even rejecting postmodernism. Postmodernism, which gives the idea that, that we're not really sure of ourselves. There's no real framework upon mm -hmm. which to hang our life upon. Uh, it's all questioning. It's all open. It's all relative. Well, we're even replacing that now. And this is something that's very interesting within the transformational festival movement. Advocates for transformational festivals say, we're going beyond postmodern. We are now finding a framework. We're now finding a new grounding to place our lives into. And that's the sacred idea of oneness. And so what they're calling it is the era of re-enchantment. So we've gone from the spiritual, supernaturalistic worldview of Christianity, then to modernity uh, and secularism, then to postmodernism for the last 40 years. And now these transformational events, being the sharp edge of the spear socially and culturally, are changing the way people look and say, okay, we're no longer postmodern because now we have a framework, we have a grounding. We're re-enchanting the world. This is fascinating. Because, so this isn't really a pluralism in the postmodern sense. This is actually finding a new doctrine, embracing a new doctrine. So when I think of that famous quote, I think it's G.K. Chesterton who said or something like pluralism is merely the transition from one orthodoxy to another. Are we actually seeing that? You know, a rejection of, uh, say, you know, Western Christian orthodoxy, go through the uh, the pluralism of postmodernism and now finding a new orthodoxy. And that is actually what's happened. Although there's all this tremendous variety that we see happening in these festivals, that's a surface variety. Actually, it's all pointing to this new orthodoxy of the one. Right. Absolutely. Bingo. You've got it. Is it right to say that this oneness is very much a new age kind of metaphysics, you know, in which the uh, the world is generally held to be less real than the one or illusory in some sense, so that, you know, the differences between everything are to be seen as unreal? And, and, and so by recognizing that unreality of differences, we transcend all those differences and become one, that new age kind of thinking. Is, is that central to this? That very much is cosmic humanism. This is really cosmic humanism, uh, a blossoming of cosmic humanism, which is really nothing more than the new age with various trappings. Uh, what is fascinating is that if you take a look at the old myths, the old pagan ideals, it is all about the one. It is all about mankind, uh, the divinities and nature being reflected in each other, also known as continuity. And that truly is the idea of oneness that we are all somehow inseparable at the core level. We are all truly one. All pagan ideology, all pagan myth speaks to this in some way or another, uh, and in a lot of various various nuances. But 
the bottom line is this idea of continuity between the divinities, between mankind, and between nature. We are all part of this big chain of existence, this circle of existence. Whereas the worldview of, of biblical Christianity says, no, it's not. We're not all one. We're not becoming God-like in our capacity. Uh, rather, there is a separation between the true God, the creator, who is distinct and transcendent, versus the rest of the universe. But what's fascinating is, is when you're reading through some of the, the materials from these transformational events, many of the organizers recognize that, oh, this goes back to the idea of the, of the Bacchanalian-type festivals, the, the ancient uh, mythological festivals. This, this takes us back to the pursuit of ancient wisdom literature and the ancient wisdom teachings. You hear this over and over again. So they themselves recognize they're not really giving us anything new. Hmm. They're just reinventing the old alternative worldview of paganism, the old world worldview of oneness, and, and, and putting it within a new box for a, a new generation. Yes, I mean, that phrase keeps coming out, the old but new. Right. And right. when I was seeing that uh, TED lecture by G.K. Lung, um, he was talking about the, the power of electronic music in particular. And it seemed he was making a big thing of the fact that it's this old worldview plus this new means of uh, getting in contact and, and, and refreshing that old worldview through this new music, which needs to be absolutely key to what's going on here. Now, of course, he, he presented it as if the music was some kind of conduit in order to open up a spiritual reality here. But looking at it from the point of view of the interviews that we've had here on this podcast, we've been looking at the new age it seems very much to fit into that kind of critique of meditation, that kind of meditation that overrides your critical faculties. You know, if we take our understanding as the ability to recognize the difference between opposites, so I, you know, I look at something and I say that's A, and I look at something else and I say that's not A, and I, I therefore am able to distinguish between these opposites. In a kind of mystical understanding, you transcend that, you think you transcend that by blanking the mind in various ways, perhaps through a meditative technique. But in this particular case with this transformational festival, it's, it's not so much that it's the music it's the power of the thudding bass that's creating this sort of hypnotic effect and through that blanks the mind in that way and gives you the illusion that you're transcending the world and he's as i say he presents it as a conduit to a spiritual reality but is he actually just really recapitulating that same old new ageism of meditative techniques overriding the mind Right. I would agree with you with that. Uh, the music component is is very, very important. But what is interesting is, is when you take a look at the whole spectrum of transformational festivals, while electronic dance music is the dominant feature in many of these events, in fact, the majority, I can point you to different festivals where there's folk music, uh, even a cappella music. But when you take a look at some of those events that don't bring about simply EDM or electronic dance music, but incorporate other themes, what you see, though, is, is nevertheless the fact that the organizers are still preaching that this is that this is still a modeling of an experience of oneness and that we're now doing it not necessarily through the music that's a part of it, but we're doing it through the fact that we are all coming together with that oneness in mind. We're coming together to intentionally experience that, whether it is through the music specifically electronic dance music, or whether it is through the community love and the community, that, that organic community interaction that takes place. What we're seeing here, and, and I, I, I believe what you've, what you've talked about in your point is, is correct. It is just simply finding a new way of modeling the ancient ritualistic concepts mm that have always underscored the pagan ideology and the pagan worldview. Yes, I wasn't trying to say that is the only way in which that could be achieved, because as you say, these different festivals have right. different characters. Right. But um, some of the other things that struck me that could actually feed into the same kind of thing would be the prevalence of surrealist art, which seems to be pretty much all over these festivals. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I, I love surrealist art, actually, so long as I kind of stand back from it and realize what's going on. But if you if you sort of immerse yourself in that way of thinking, it can say to you that the phenomenal world is not real, right. which I think is quite a dangerous way of thinking. But if you're actually living in the middle of the desert and you're surrounded by surrealist images all the time, that I'm sure that's the message you're going to get. The, the, the world you live in is not real. What's real is the one. 
Right, exactly. And, and you really hit a very important point there in terms of the art. The music a- a- acts in the same manner. I was listening to one interview with, with uh, an electronic dance music performer, uh, a, a technician, and he was describing the role of electronic dance music in these festivals and how it brings together this, this new sense of reality, this new interconnectedness. But he said something interesting. He also said that you wouldn't experience this if you were just dancing and bobbing along to it in your bedroom, individually. He says, you're not going to have that same interconnection, that same sense of of ritualistic Mm -hmm. contact one to the next. It has to be done in a group dynamic or in an immersive dynamic. And that's where the aspect of sacred art, visionary art comes in. And that creates its own dynamic uh, of where you are immersed within it. And Burning Man is the perfect example of immersive art, immersive artistic experience. Uh, because you can go to Burning Man and not go to a single dance event uh, you know, if you don't want to. But Burning Man really represents a, a place where, uh, where visionary art and community comes together and creates a new reality, a new temporary reality. But it's the idea of here that you're not stepping away from it. You're not separate from it. You're not enjoying art for the sake of of just enjoying it, learning from it, appreciating it. No, you are becoming it. Mm. And that's where the oneness aspect comes in, either through the music or through the art, through the sense of community, through the group rituals, the group sacred experiences, the group yoga. You are immersing yourself within the one. You're all now coming together. Absolutely. And having seen some of those presentations and that lecture by Guy K. Lung, I can get an idea of what's going on there. But actually just having this conversation now and exchanging words, it's actually really difficult, isn't it, to get an idea of what's going on there. So it's an immersive, lived in kind of experience. But having seen some of those presentations, yes, I can see the kind of thing they're getting at and and the power of that and the, the deception of that, quite frankly, because it does seem to be a recreation of a whole mythical space a kind of reveling in the idea of myth, knowing it's myth and choosing to live inside it and enjoying that mythos. He actually uses that word in his lecture. Right. And that's difficult to describe with words. It really is. So I, I do actually recommend people go and uh, watch some of the, I put those things in the links to the show notes actually, just so you can get an idea of how that feels and then that will give life to some of the words that we're using here. Absolutely. You know, that's interesting because I appreciate you bringing in the aspect of myth. Uh, oneness is is displayed through ancient myth and the new myths that we're creating today. But the concept of myth is so important in some of these transformational mm-hmm. events. In the U.S., there are a number of fairy festivals where the fairy myth, elven, nature divinities, all the rest is wrapped up within literally a fairy-like atmosphere, a new mythological uh, way of, of looking at the world through the lens of fairies and how now you completely integrate yourself within that. There's transformational festivals simply devoted to that. England, I believe, has a couple of fairy festivals. In fact, some of the old festivals like Wicker Man, uh, have now become transformational. They always have been transformational, but they are also bringing in the music side and all the rest to, to allow the participants to have a full immersive experience. And so it's a reintroduction of ancient myth along with a new way of doing it, a new reality, a new way of doing the myth. And so we're seeing this incredible reach back in time for the old ways of living through reality and now integrating it with all kinds of of new approaches, music, art, community, and of course, being globally hopping on a plane. You can go and experience this, whether it's in in the high country of Nepal at at the transformational festival known as Universal Religion, or you can go to the the mountains of British Columbia, Canada to Shambhala and, and go to the transformational festival of Shambhala or to Nevada, to Burning Man, and people do. People go around the world, which is why Tomorrowland has its own jet aircraft fleets that literally fly in young young people from around the world to come to the concert experience of Tomorrowland. And it is a concert, and while the concert's going on, you are completely immersed within a a new myth. Even the stages are set up as as a mythical uh, reality. You are walking into literally another world. The trailers for the event all bring out that this is all a new New myth, a new mythical experience, and you you enter literally in your mind, in your consciousness, the fact that you are now experiencing a reality outside of the one that you normally live in. 
Yes, indeed. And in one of those presentations, I think somebody actually said, oh, it's it's all about what's going on in here. And he pointed to his head. That seemed to be what it was really the center of, of what That's it was right. all about. And the interesting thing, we've used the word myth many, many times in just the last few minutes. And I was just thinking a few decades ago, this would have been considered to be just impossible when, when we were living in the modern era with a capital M, the modern era. Right. And I'm thinking of that uh, biblical prophecy that's in Second Timothy. It just seems to fit so perfectly, doesn't it? Second Timothy uh, chapter 4, verse 3, for the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myth. Myths. There it is, absolutely perfectly stated. They will choose myths, turn to them away from the truth. Right. And we are seeing that literally taking place. Yeah. Can I ask you just one more thing about this whole business of coming together, this joining together in community, which seems to be such a, a huge part of what's going on here? I mean, when you look at it on the surface, a lot of this can seem to be quite positive in some ways, you know, because community, it's a good thing, isn't it? You know, but the way that that community seems to be expressed seems to be maximum diversity and maximum tolerance but with that kind of postmodern definition of tolerance. So maximum diversity of people and styles, music and hairdos and all the rest of it. Right. With it, a maximum tolerance in that particular sense. Do you want to say something about what that tolerance means? It means anything and everything outside of an expression that there is truth beyond what they're speaking. Mm. And in that regards, that is the biblical worldview. Everything can be and will be tolerated. And I mean everything. Clothing is optional for many of these events. Some of them are very sexually open in terms of expanding your sexual appetites. Uh, some of it is just outrageous costuming and outrageous ways of living. All of that can be accepted within the parameters of, of depending, of course, on, on which event we're talking about. Nonetheless, if you declare that oneness is not the reality, that indeed there is an alternate reality, that there is a reality that says that at its core, oneness is illusionary and wrong. Uh, you will be hated. You will be ostracized. You will not fit. And of course, what we're talking about here is the biblical principles of truth. It's very interesting how this anomaly that we have in the Old Testament and New Testament, that God is transcendent and God is outside of his creation, we are at war with that totally at war with that. And I, I have brought this up in different conversations. If oneness is true, then there should be no room at all. There should be, in fact, no existence at all of an alternative worldview that says, no, we're not one. We are really two. And I know this in every aspect and core of who I am. I know this in, in, in historically. I know this scripturally. It all says that there is an alternative to oneness. And of course, then, if that does exist, if this alternative to oneness exists, well, then oneness by its nature isn't real. There is obviously an opposite. And so it's interesting, if you bring about the idea here that, that what they're doing is illusionary, if indeed reality is centered in the exclusive message, act and work of Jesus Christ, well, they're not very tolerant of that, because now you just you just put a wedge in and you've split it down the middle and, and that shatters the illusion. That shatters the illusion of oneness. And so there is a, there is hostility immediately when you bring in notions of a higher standard, that real truth exists. Mm. So this is not the classical definition of tolerance where I have my view and you have yours and we may disagree and we tolerate each other. We live, we shake hands, but we, we differ in opinion. That's not acceptable. No, no. In fact, there mm. is a marked hostility in, in many of these events, Burning Man particularly, mm. towards Christianity, where Christianity claims Jesus Christ is, a, is salvation Mankind is fallen. Mankind cannot achieve divinity. Rather, God is divine, transcendent, and beyond the ability for human, humanity to ascend to. Uh, and we have to put our, our, whole, uh, our whole salvation on, on the finished work of Jesus Christ. Well, that does not fly. In fact, last year, last year one of the art installations was called the Church Trap. And it was a, a large church with a steeple, and it was propped up with a, a big log beam uh, with the idea that here's a rope, and you would pull it, and of course it would come down. It wouldn't come down, but it was all structured to look like that. And it was saying, here is the trap. Christianity is, is something yeah. that will entrap you. 
and rather look around you, look around and see the the inclusivity and mm. non-judgmentalism that we can experience here. Get away from the church. Out here in in the uh, this mythological world where there's no truth, we're nice and free. <laughs> I, right. I, I noticed that picture actually. Many people have taken a picture of that. It was uh, you know put onto Flickr by various people, and I believe that at the end of the festival they burnt that as well. So you actually had that picture of a burning right. church. Right, right. A very disturbing picture actually, indeed. Right. I have a contact, a, a friend who goes to Burning Man and has been going for a number of years. In fact, he was going when it was still far more of a, of, of a bohemian experience where the transformational element really wasn't in play so strongly in the 1990s. It was more about the party, about the booze, about running naked across the desert, uh, getting getting hammered and getting high. Uh, and, and so there's been a lot of change in the last 15 years. But he goes, and as a Christian, witnessing to the people coming to and from Burning Man, and uh, that wasn't tolerated very kindly. And, and indeed, he was told he needed to leave Burning Man. Uh, because he was just simply asserting that there is a standard, there is a truth, mm. and that truth is not subjective. It's not something that's relative. There is a standard that is outside of human existence, one that we look to, uh, and that comes from a transcendent God. And and they basically told him, there's the gate. You can do your thing, but you have to do it outside the gate. Get out of the city. And he wasn't going in there just using the word Jesus, because presumably you could go in there and say, hey, I'm a Jesus person. And as long as you don't give any content to what you're saying there, I presume that will be just, hey, fine, I'm a Krishna person. I'm a this, that and the other. But if you give the content, the kind of thing that you've just been saying there, that's what makes the difference. Absolutely. That's what creates the division. Everybody and anybody has uh, an opinion of who Jesus is. In fact, 2,000 years ago, Jesus asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? And we have had a plethora of opinions ever since. The Mormons have their opinion of who Jesus is. The New Agers have a Jesus. The UFO people have a Jesus. Uh, the yeah. secularists have a Jesus. Everybody has a Jesus. But when you go in and then you define who he is, that this shatters your idea of oneness because here is an exclusive deity, an exclusive individual, literally God manifested in flesh, and that your hope can't be placed upon your own trappings, your own techniques, your own rituals, your own community, your own experience, nothing of you. Well, that's harsh. That's harsh for a world that says, uh uh, uh what we want is the experience of oneness. Could I ask you to briefly give us an idea of how all this came to be, you know, the kind of history of this? Because, I mean, a lot of what's going on in these events reminds me, you know, it's a kind of echo of the the counterculture movements of the 1960s and early 70s, you know, the sort of flower power right, era, right. as it's pejoratively yep. referred to. Um, I sometimes think a, a lot of Christians don't really understand what was going on there. I mean, I find that a lot of people are rather dismissive of, of that period. So some people disapprove, you know, sort of ridicule what was going on back then, but without really realizing it was, a, in large measure, a, a, an expression of disillusionment at the materialistic world and the hypocrisy of culture. I mean, Francis Schaeffer, of course, goes into that in, into a lot of detail. So I'm wondering if we're seeing a kind of recapitulation of that now. I mean, that's just I'm just throwing that out for the moment. So could you give us a kind of um, potted history of how we got to this position? Absolutely. In fact, you're correct. We have been dismissive of the 60s and early 70s, and yet that was a time period that frames or provides a launching pad for what we're what we're seeing today. I have mm -hmm. friends who, uh, one particular friend who was a, a Marxist uh, student leader in the 1960s, and he is now a Christian, and he looks back at, at that time period, and now he looks at what's taking place today, and he says, the seeds that we planted then are now now finally coming to fruition the way that were that they were originally meant to be but of course in 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 the heydays of the 60s and 70s you did have things like the woodstock festival which was labeled an aquarian explosion you you did have a period in the 60s and 70s when the gurus of the east came west and introduced eastern mysticism in into western culture uh, there was at that point in time a very strong movement, a political movement even, towards the idea of world unity, world oneness. All that was coming in. And of course, in the 60s and 70s, this was couched in an anger and an animosity towards the traditional Christian, Judeo-Christian view of values and ethics and even, even social norms. And so there, there was a rejection of that 
as there was an embracing of this other worldview. And can, can I just jump in there? Because uh, many people will say, yes, yes, I can see that. But one of the elements that needs to be brought into that critique there is what Francis Schaeffer said. And that was that a lot of that was taking place because the church at the time didn't understand what was going on. And many people in the church were complacent, were dismissive. They weren't engaging the culture at the time. And so people thought, well, I don't want to have anything to do with Christianity because it's it's not living up to what it believes in. Oh, absolutely. In fact, that is key. Uh, people have asked, where did this begin with? And I say it began with us in the Christian community uh, mm. dropping the ball of what it really means to be a Christian and what yeah. and what it means to be serious about what God's Word says. Uh, ironically, and maybe not ironically, uh, the Christian community, the church community, took the same approach to the New Age movement in the 80s and 90s. Uh, and while there were some people in the 80s and 90s who, who were, uh, as Christian authors, in fact, there was quite a few who, who at that point in time were pointing to the dangers of the New Age movement, the rise of this, as simply not just simply a, a, a spiritual dynamic, but also one that was injecting itself into our social fabric. I'm amazed, Julian, at how many Christian leaders at the time, and I ran into many of them myself, Back in the 90s, we're saying, ah, oh, the New Age movement, it's its not really that relevant to what's happening in my church. It's not really re that relevant to what's happening in my community. Meanwhile, their children were, were being immersed in it in their schools. Our entertainment industry was preaching and promoting it. And even today, I have talked with different church leaders who have said, oh, the New Age movement, that's so yesterday. That was the 1990s and the 1980s. We don't really have any danger of the New Age movement today. Meanwhile, we're celebrating it openly in transformational <laughs> festivals, yes. bringing then, in hundreds, sure. hundreds of thousands of people. And I agree with you. And yet there's the other side of the coin as well, where you have various writers and speakers saying the new age, it's all of the devil. It's all terrible. And, you know, we must all pray against it and all these kinds of ideas as well, which I think is also misguided. Um, and the reason why I'm saying that is because I was very influenced. I mean, people who listen to this show will know this well. I was very influenced by a, a, a preacher in a very, very small congregation called Brian Austin in London, who spent a lot of his time Time, interacting with people who are involved in the new age and he was getting alongside them all the time and he was trying to, to reconcile trying to find ways in which they could agree and yet still holding to the truth of Christ and so whenever it came up against something that you know that there was that clash that worldview clash then he would hold, obviously hold to the truth of Christ and and tell them you know this this is this is real but nevertheless he was trying to be alongside them so there was none of that sense of oh you're all of the darkness and that kind of, this is a terrible trap as well I think well, and that speaks to that speaks to to the fact that as I've interviewed and and rubbed shoulders with people either through the political side in world federalist circles, or in the New Age movement, and I've rubbed shoulders with a lot uh, of even occultists, they have good intentions. Many of them, not all, but many of them have very good intentions. And the importance for us as Christians is to recognize that they're created in God's image. They have a soul. They are human beings. And we just we just don't write them off. Rather, we come alongside, and I believe using the example of Jesus with the woman at the well and the example of Paul at Mars Hill, we come alongside of their culture and we bring and speak truth into that culture. We bring and speak truth into those individual lives, even if it's not necessarily always the most comfortable thing to do. And we do it in such a way that demonstrates truth and love. And if we can't do that, we're, 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 we're gongs, we're, we're clanging cymbals, we're, we're lots of noise, and that's all we are. One of my friends uh, that does go to Burning Man, he's, he is concerned that there will come a day when the Christian community wakes up to Burning Man and approaches it in the wrong way. That is to go there with loudspeakers and denounce it and to do prayer marches around it in, in an open display that this is now... We are battling against the individual and not the idea. We're battling against the individual and not the real worldview behind it. And in so doing, we'll reinforce that stereotype held by the participants who go to Burning Man. It will only solidify their view of Christianity. Mm -hmm. Rather, instead, what he's been doing and what his small team has been doing is going there, passing out bottles of water, 
changing tires that have gone flat, going to and from the, the event, talking to people one-on-one. Uh, and when they ask the question, why are you giving me this water? Or why are you helping me change my tire? He'll say, well, I, the reason I'm doing this is I am motivated as a Christian. And then he'll bring in the biblical truth and they will listen because he's already demonstrated to them love. He didn't stand there with a bullhorn blaring in their face. Rather, he demonstrated with love and humility, and he was a servant to them first. Then they were open to hear. Uh, he, de- he, he told me once about a, a situation where, where he came alongside an elderly man going into the gates of Burning Man, and he just came alongside and said, hey, you know, why are you going? He interacted with him at, at the human level. He didn't go up to him and say, don't go in there. He said, hey, wh- why are you going? I'm, I'm curious as to what's, what's motivating you. And the fellow turned to, to my friend Robert and he said, I have terminal cancer and I'm looking for meaning and purpose in life. And that's that was the open door. And then Robert was able to sit down with him for an extended period and share and talk and listen to him and bring Jesus Christ into the conversation. That's far more effective than simply... Uh, erecting a great big wall around the event and, and hoping that their influence won't spill over and, and you and you blaring at them uh, with bullhorns from the towers. Absolutely. Is this the guy who goes and, and camps out with an Israeli flag? Yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Why does he do that? Because it's a lightning rod. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lightning rod. In fact, in fact, he is known already, well known within the burning community as a Christian. Um, he is well known in in that respect, and and he has for years hoisted an Israeli flag outside the city gates, a couple of miles away, with his own tent and his own little place set up, and it will bring to to his tent Jews who are curious. It'll bring Arabs who are curious, and it'll bring just the curious. Why are you out here? That's really interesting. So that's that's the one kind of sign that you don't expect to see in that circumstance. That's bingo, bingo, and then he uses that yeah. as as the the leverage to talk to them about jesus christ uh and he says oftentimes they'll throw back at his face well there is no truth and then he'll use provocative ways to demonstrate yes there is truth um and and will lead them lead them into into a discussion that sometimes can be quite intimidating but the end result being that they realize that their worldview is illogic that there is a truth in fact, they'll even hold to that truth when they're confronted with it. And he'll demonstrate that their worldview is inconsistent. And so they better look at the other worldview. Mm-hmm. Now, you say that uh, we are in our ministry here, we are opposed to the oneness doctrine, but we're not against the people who are involved in that. Obviously, a very important distinction to make. However, I Absolutely. want to take it a little bit further than that, because... I'm wondering whether actually there are lots of other things that are going on in those festivals that we're also not against, but are actually in some ways very close to Christian ideas. I mean, I'm just, I had a whole list of things that occurred to me and going on in these festivals. We have art, community, acceptance of people who are different, the democratization of creativity. So it's not just elite people who can play an instrument or paint or whatever, but everybody can do this. Uh, Parenting skills, the value of family general love is encouraged uh, a culture of giving was a big one that came over so people would exchange things just as gifts uh, there's an anti-war attitude an anti-corporate structure attitude um, the rejection of the idea of human I- isolation so you see somebody sitting alone you go and talk to them you know a longing for a new world as well a longing even for a new humanity that even human beings should be different now, look, all those things that are there come under the umbrella it seems to me of christian ideals so this this can make it really difficult to say to people, well, look, Christianity is fundamentally different to this. Do you see what I mean? There's a difficulty there. Oh, yes, yes. And that is why that is why you have to go beyond the trappings of what this is, either the the trappings of music or those commonalities that all humanity is looking for. We're all looking for for a sense of identity. We're all we, we, we want to be treated well. We want to treat other well, we should want to treat others well. And the, many of those other things you brought in, which are, are truly there, there's nothing wrong with them. So you have to go beyond what that is and then ask really the bigger question. What is the core idea or philosophy that's being expressed with those things still in mind? Those things cannot be cannot be ignored. So may I now turn this around on its head and ask the question of us as Christians, as the church, why is it that people are going to these festivals and not coming to Christian communities to find art, community, acceptance of people, creativity, parenting skills, family, love, 
giving, anti-war, anti-corporate structure, et cetera, et cetera. Why are they going there and not to us? Well, number one, it's far more exciting. And Lisa, <laughs> this is, this is, <laughs> and this is what I've been hearing from many people who go to these events. Church is dead. Church is dying. Church is, is boring compared to this. This is, this is now experiencing the new world. What's interesting, God does not ask us to experience his new world in its full sense. He will do that in his due time when he creates his new heavens and new earth. Yep. What we know, what, what we find within the human, the human uh, identity is we don't want to wait. We want that now. Mm -hmm. And so we push for that now, however that may be identified. What I find fascinating with all of this is, yes, the Christian community has for the longest time ignored art ignored so many of these things that these people are drawn to. Yes. Francis Schaeffer himself talked about the importance of art and culture uh, in his book, How Then Shall We Live? And in some of his lectures and some of his other writings. And in the Christian community, we have had a sense of ignoring some of those things that really truly make us unique as human beings. And so th this goes back again to the conversation we had a few minutes ago where you recognize the fact that Christianity, even in the 1960s, dropped the ball. It didn't just drop the ball in, in how it wouldn't approach the cultural change of the day and sometimes even ignore, not sometimes, many times just simply ignore the cultural change of the day, but it also ignored those fundamental things that make humanity unique. And art mm -hmm. is a big part of that. Music is part of that. Interacting. Uh, recognizing one another as being human beings. I mean, I've, I've been very, very disappointed in some of the conversation I've seen take place within the Burning Man question for Christianity. And, and so much of it has been, well, you know, let the pagans burn, that kind of an idea. <sighs> yeah, like, yeah. no, no, absolutely. no. Yeah, no These absolutely are not. Mm. These are human beings, and let's respect that. They are mm. creating God's image. We need to respect that. And so a lot of what you've just said there boils down to some of this actually teaching us something, not at its core, not at its philosophical core or in terms of uh, immorality. Right. But some of these other aspects, the art, the community of acceptance, some, some of this is it should, I think, be saying to us, hey, wake up. We're losing some of this. We need to regain some of this. And, and see, that's the thing. We have lost a lot of that already within our within our culture. We've lost a lot of that in our culture. And so mm. this is a place where that becomes re introduced, but now with an, a, a new meaning behind it. Uh, one of the things that we can learn from this, and I think it's it's more important than anything else, and, and I don't want this to be an issue that scares people, but instead wakes them up to take their faith seriously, and that is that the core now is the dominant worldview. However the trappings and however good it looks, the core uh, demonstrates that our world has already changed. So this is the barometer of the change. Right. This, is, this isn't something that we should say, oh, no, these festivals are arising. They in themselves are going to transform the world in this Bingo. unfortunate spiritual way. This is already a barometer of what's happening. Exactly. This is nothing more. And this is what the transformational movement tells you. This is nothing more than the mirror, a mirror upon society. It already is there. It's already embedded in the soul and heart of your neighbor, your family, your friends, your school, your industry, your business, the list goes on, your culture, it's already there. We're just mirroring it now, mirroring it and celebrating it. The other thing, though, that we also have to recognize is that while there's lots of good, you could say, that comes out of, out of this with some of the very positive things you brought in, there's a reality behind much of it that isn't very pleasant at all. Burning Man has been known for the suicides, for the rapes, uh, for the murder, uh, there has been some pretty nasty stuff that's taken place at Burning Man. And some of these other festivals, it's not all uh, roses either. Uh, I, I had a, a friend come up to me at a conference after I'd given a presentation on this, and uh, she became a friend afterwards, and, and she was telling me how her son went to Lightning in a Bottle, a, a very... A spiritually alive event in, in California, a transformational festival, and how her son had gone and, and had told his mom how beautiful this was, and he'd been there for a number of years already, and this is a place of, of complete trust and non-judgmentalism, and that you're free here and everybody respects one another, and he had, he had a backpack. And he had his laptop, he had $800 in cash, and basically all of his personal possessions in this backpack. And he left it by a tree and went dancing, uh, you know, with, with electronic music and danced the night away kind of thing. And he returned and, well, surprise, surprise, it was stole. 
And for him, that really set him back because all of a sudden he went, oh, what? I, I didn't think we were supposed to have this kind of negativity here. I thought this was supposed to be a place of complete trust and, and peace and honesty and, and, and open relationships and open the real open reality that, that we are all working together as one. And, and who would steal my stuff? It hadn't created the new human being after all. Right, exactly. Yeah, you know, there's things we can learn. I think the, the core thing we need to learn, however, is that our society already has fundamentally changed to the point where we can mirror these uh, this change in such massive celebrations and they're not going away they're not a fad mm. and again demand far outpaces supply so what does that tell me what does that tell you as a christian as your listeners who are christians what does that tell us it's time that we take seriously the gospel message and we look at the model of jesus mm -hmm. at the with the woman on the well and we look at the model of paul and then we incorporate that in how we interact with this new world. You've come to exactly my last question. Could you tell us how you interpret those two passages to help us actually engage with this situation? Oh, oh, uh, number one with Paul. Paul's uh, situation in Acts 17 is, is phenomenal because he's basically experiencing what we are uh, experiencing today. Paul sees a society that, that incorporates all kinds of deities, all kinds of religious philosophies, and sees at Mars Hill even a, a monument with the inscription to the unknown God. And then he takes and uses that culture, and he uses that spirituality to bring about a conversation, uh, even quoting their own philosophers, quoting their own so-called theologians, and then using that as a leverage point. And he does this in the marketplace. He does it with the trendsetters of the day. And he uses all of it to bring about the message of Jesus Christ. But I find it fascinating. He didn't go in there with bullhorns. He didn't go in there and slammed them. He went in and he knew enough about it already that he could quote them. And he already knew enough of their worldview that he could walk in and use it as a leverage point. My friend Robert, when he's going to Burning Man, he's exemplifying that already. Uh, he knows the culture. He already knows what people are thinking going there. So he can then leverage that to bring about a conversation and swing it back toward what's important. Jesus, on the other hand, uh, does something very interesting on a one and -on one basis with the woman at the well in John chapter 4. And what's interesting there is he steps outside of that culture and talks to a woman, which is a taboo, and not just any woman, but a Samaritan woman, really taboo. He entered her comfort zone. He entered her comfort zone, and then he opens up a point of interest. And of course, that's the water and the well. And he uses all of this to arouse curiosity, to bring about a conversation. He, he engages with her. And, and he, he, what's interesting with, with Jesus' action here is he even restrains himself. Along the way, he just drops bits and pieces until the end. And then he confronts directly. And in all of this, he didn't condemn her. Her sin already condemns her. And, but he, what he does is he sticks to the main issue, to the main point. He, he brings about to her that now indeed, in fact, the Savior is right there in front of her. But he does it in a way that, that is a beautiful model for us because he entered her culture. He didn't wait for her to come to him. And, and I've, had this, I've had this happen where people say, well, you know, I should just invite my neighbors and just invite the people who I know are like this to my church. And I'm going, yeah. well, you don't get it. They've already rejected it. Yeah, they're not going to come. That's right. They're not going to come. So that means you have to go to them. And you have to go to them with two things, love and truth. Absolutely. That does seem to be more and more the model that we have to follow. But I have to say, or I have to ask you, really, do you think that this is for everybody? I mean, in that, that case there, you've just spoken about uh, Jesus with the Samaritan woman. OK, that's one thing. But if you're going into a situation where people are perhaps not wearing any clothes and it's, you know, really, really loud music and all sorts of weird and wacky things are going on. And <laughs> could everybody cope with that situation? No, no. In fact, um, my friend Robert uh, has told me a little bit about some of his experience of bringing people on board and alongside with his team and how it is not for everybody and how some people have been very, very bothered by what they were seeing. Uh, and, and it really, really created problems for them. And, and he realized that at that point that, you know, not everybody is cut out for this and not everybody is. 
Mm. Uh, there are people who can do this. There are people who do do this. I know uh, another small team that goes to to pagan events and to to New Age conferences in Denver and in Colorado as Christians. Um, not for everybody. I've been to some of those. It's not for everybody, but they go expressly uh, to be a Christian witness and to do so in a way uh, that is that is demonstrating again love and truth. But it is a a a dark and 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 very um, it can be a very tense situation when you're in that kind of a, a kind of an environment. I have two friends who are Christian witnesses to Mormons in Utah. And there's a large transformational festival that takes place at the Hare Krishna temple just outside of Salt Lake City. Yes, one of the largest Hare Krishna temples on the planet is just outside of Salt Lake City. Wow. And they go there for the Holly Fest. And the Holly Fest is a transformational festival birthed out of pure Buddhism, or pardon me, pure Hinduism, uh, built around the Holly rituals and the Holly, Holly legends. And, and so they're there in amongst the trance dance music, uh, witnessing to Mormons at a Hindu trance festival. <laughs> that is extremely bizarre, yeah, indeed. <laughs> yeah, but you know, it's not for everybody. Not, no, there's, absolutely. There's people who will, who, who will find this to be overwhelming, who just won't even know how to begin to interact. Well, for those who do, who can handle that, great, support them, put them there. Uh, help them uh, and by, by, through prayer and through even financial support. If you know teams that are going in and doing these types of things in a way that, again, demonstrates love and truth. For the rest of those of us who don't, you need to be aware. You need to have knowledge of these things. Again, particularly the core philosophy and spiritual attitude behind it. Mm. And then have an, a knowledge of that so that you and your congregation do not become susceptible, gullible, to doing this and becoming a part of this. I'm watching Christians now who accept the idea of oneness and holism and, and interdependence. Literally, we're seeing the new age coming in within Christendom in certain areas. In the emergent church, we see elements of this over and over again. In fact, there are two Christian events that ha are more akin to transformational festivals, where it's about looking for a new reality, modeling a new society, but not based on on the solid biblical principles that we've been discussing earlier, but on the idea of, of integrating the one, integrating wholeness, or the whole bit. I'm like, you're, you're just mirroring what the transformational festivals are are doing, which is nothing yes. more than a mirror of that worldview that's already embedded within our culture that says Jesus Christ is not the only way. I know many ways. Yeah, and you say that uh, it's not for everybody to actually go into these festivals, but those principles that you were talking about from John 4 and Acts 17, they still do apply to all of us, because if it's true that these festivals are a barometer of where the world is at, where our culture is at, then we can still use those principles to discuss with our neighbour who might have similar oneness kinds of views, even though they don't go along to that festival. Absolutely. In fact, that's so important that we do that. Uh, that's so important that we, we are willing to not just live the Christian life, but uh, speak the Christian message. Yeah. Well, Carl, it has been fascinating speaking with you. I mean, this is a this is really quite a bizarre subject, isn't it? As I said earlier in the interview, it's incredibly difficult to sort of get your mind around it unless you've got these images and these sounds uh, to help you because the whole thing is so centered in imagination so as i said before please do go and and listen and, and watch some of those things that are out there um, but i think you have given us a, a, a tremendous introduction to this and given us an idea of just how important this is to take seriously and also to reflect upon our own sense of mission as well so not just look out and see what's happening but also to ask ourselves within ourselves what not just what can i do but how can i think faithfully about this and interact with my neighbors who may be thinking in these kinds of ways so i do thank you for all the advice and information that you've given us. It's been absolutely fantastic. Before we actually close, could you just remind us how people can get hold of your material at Forcing Change and how they can subscribe to your publication as well? Certainly. They can go to forcingchange.org, forcingchange.org, and you can sign up. It's a monthly subscription, $4.50 gets you in and it gives you, and that's $4.50 per month, gives you access to all the newest issues and eight years plus of all the back issues, uh, well over 1,500, maybe 1,800 pages already of reports, essays, 
major articles. Well, I, this is why I tell people, Julian, when you have it in your hands, spread it around, give it out to friends, give it out to neighbors, use it as a launching point for some, some serious discussions. And uh, that that is what I'm hoping will happen when, when people take a look at the material. Uh, think about it, reflect on it, uh, challenge it even within your own sense and use it as a way to help equip you with knowledge. Fantastic stuff. Thank you ever so much. It's been great speaking to you. I'm very, very pleased that you came on the show. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for the opportunity. 